Zifo, your X Factor in pain management with proven performance in relieving pain and inflammation. Zifo provides potent, effective relief of pain and inflammation and can be used for your patients suffering from lower back pain, soft tissue injury, post op pain, OA and RA flare ups, migraine, dysmenorrhea, and gout. Zifo has shown a comparable tolerability and safety profile. Zifo also has a balanced COX 1, COX 2 inhibition to balance your patient's risk for side effects. Zifo has a range of formulations and flexible dosing to suit your patient's needs. Good evening, everybody. Uh, a very warm welcome to you on behalf of VIT Sport and Health, WISH, and in particular, our Sports Concussion Interest Group, who is delighted to host this meeting this evening. Uh, as always, a, a big thank you to our sponsors, the Asina Lita uh, Pharmaceutical Company, manufacturers of Zifo. And of course, as always in the background, Dr. Robin Saggers, who's managing all the technical aspects and has done a lot of the communication. Also to Nadine Peterson, our very capable administrator. Thank you very much for all the communication that goes out. And to you and Nandi Butelezi for all the social media that helps promote this type of event and talk. As I said, it's hosted by the uh, WISH Sports Concussion Interest Group. We try and host three or four similar meetings a year. Uh, and this is a very, very special meeting because we've got uh, a wonderful speaker who's going to present to you this evening. And it really is uh, a great pleasure to welcome someone uh, with, with whom I've shared many a Zoom meeting in the last couple of years, uh, a wonderful colleague and a great leader in, in our profession. And that is Professor Catherine Schneider who's a, a certified specialist in musculoskeletal physiotherapy and has a certificate in vestibular rehabilitation. Catherine is an associate professor and clinical scientist in physiotherapy at the Sport Injury Prevention Research Center, the Faculty of Kinesiology at the University of Calgary in Canada. And it really is a great pleasure to welcome someone who is a true leader in our field. Uh, Catherine has led much of the research in this area of sport-related concussion, in particular in terms of uh, prevention and in terms of intervention in a multimodal capacity. Uh, she has also taken up a tremendous leadership role in the International Concussion in Sports Group and in fact was up at six her time this morning uh, on our board meeting. So Catherine, thanks very much for your commitment to the field of sports concussion. Thank you very much for everything you've done for the field. I know uh, many of the 360 registered attendees this evening have followed your work very carefully and you'll be pleased to know that it's had a huge influence in South Africa in terms of uh, management of sport related concussion. So we owe you a lot and we are very, very grateful that you've given up more time to share with us this evening. So welcome from Wits University and our Faculty of Health Sciences. I'm going to do what everyone's looking forward to and that's mute myself and hand over to you to share your screen and take us forward for the next hour or so. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, uh, John, and thanks so much for the invitation to speak with your group. And um, it truly is an honor to be able to speak and to share some of the work um, of our group and um, of our large team. And uh, I, I've really had the pleasure of working with a, a large group of individuals around the world that all share an interest in the area of sport-related concussion. <clears throat> Pardon me. And uh, I, uh, it's very, I've really enjoyed uh, a lot of the meetings and a lot of the collaborative work that I've done with many of you as I see some of the names that are coming up today. And uh, I, I wanna say thank you to the large team that I have the pleasure of working with. And uh, also big thanks to Dr. Patricius for all of the work that he does in this area and uh, he truly is a leader in this area as well and I have the fortune of collaborating with him on uh, one of our international projects right now which is very exciting. 
So I will uh, speak to you today about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart um, that I spend lots of time thinking and researching um, along with many of you and share some of our um, research work and uh, talk a little bit about some um, some of the things that we've found and are continuing to evaluate. And uh, then I'll look forward to some questions and some discussion at the end. So before we start, uh, I'll start sharing my screen, but I'd love it if each of you could think about perhaps a patient that you've worked with or a colleague or friend, someone that may have suffered a sport related concussion. And uh, I want you to think about that person as we go through or group of people and uh, see how you might be able to apply some of what we're discussing today to your own practice or to your own um, area of research. Um, I have shared a handout that has links to all of the um, various living links that I'll talk about today through my presentation so that you can take a look at those. Um, and I'll share with you some of the work that we've done in Canada as well to build on some of this and facilitate translation of research into practice. Um, so I'm going to just do a brief background on concussion. I don't think I have to give a lot of background to this group, but uh, I think it's always good to start with a little bit of background. And I have a few pictures here and a lot of the work that I do is with uh, ice hockey, um, soccer um, and rugby. So uh, you'll get to hear a few examples of ice hockey and see what you think in terms of how some of these factors might translate over into some of the work that you do in your sports. So starting with the definition, uh, concussion is defined as a traumatic brain injury that's induced by biomechanical forces. There's a number of different symptoms and signs that can occur. And typically individuals will recover in the initial weeks, days to weeks, with most adults recovering in the initial 14 days and most children and youth recovering in the initial 30 days. And a lot of this work is based on the outputs of the fifth international consensus on concussion in sport that was held in 2006 in Berlin. And the subsequent publications were in the British Journal of Sport Medicine. Um, and those were published in the spring of 2017. The key outputs from this consensus meeting were included a series of 12 systematic reviews that were used to inform a consensus statement. And the consensus statement was largely based around 11 Rs. The importance of recognizing, removing, reevaluating, rest, rehabilitation, when to refer, when are athletes recovered, returning to sport, what to reconsider, residual effects and sequelae and risk reduction. So I'm gonna focus on the reevaluation and rehabilitation today, but I'm also gonna share with you a couple of points related to some of these other Rs. So I want you to think of one of your athletes. Are they at risk of a concussion? How do you know they have suffered a concussion? And what can you do? Hopefully by the end of today, you'll have some new tools in your toolbox that you might find helpful. So I like to frame um, a lot of the work that I do around this dynamic recursive model of the etiology of sport related concussion. And this is an adaptation of the model of sport injury that one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Winnemay Wissa, um, published in 1994. And it has subsequently evolved. And this is a publication that we have from a year and a half ago in the Journal of Orthopedic and Sport Physical Therapy where we took this model and applied it to sport related concussion. So you have your athlete that comes in and has a number of different factors that would predispose the athlete um, to concussion or injury. And some of these may or may not be modifiable. So some of the work that we have done is actually looked at symptoms. And I had a lot of patients that came into the clinic and said, well, I've, I had dizziness before my concussion or I have always had headaches. So maybe we're seeing this post-injury, but maybe this is also a factor that increases risk. So we did a study um, in just uh, under 4,000 youth ice hockey players. And what we found was that individuals that reported headache, neck pain, or dizziness at the start of the season had a greater risk of concussion. And individuals that reported any two of these symptoms had an increased risk of concussion if they were in the 11 and 12 year old age group where there was no body checking. 
or if they were in the 13 and 14 year old um, age group. Um, so we saw a different effect depending on which age group they were in. So this was interesting, but it didn't tell us why the, these symptoms were present. So we also looked at a variety of different tests and measures to look and see if perhaps some of these measures might increase the risk of concussion. And we did see that a number of different factors may increase um, this risk. So we completed a um, pilot randomized control trial to look at feasibility and in an exploratory way, look at efficacy. What we did was had uh, eight different teams that we randomized into either a control where they did their typical warm up or a prevention program where we use rehabilitation principles that we use to treat um, different cervical vestibulo-ocular balance divided attention components and sport specific training and applied this to our hockey players in a sport specific way. We had a total of 118 participants, 35 of whom were female, but all of these um, players were actually randomized to the intervention group. And I'll talk a little bit more about this trial later, but these are the same types of exercises that we use from a prevention standpoint. And we looked at a number of different outcome measures. And what we found was there was no difference in the risk of concussion between groups. Again, it was a pilot study, but if we looked at just the males, it did look like the estimate um, suggested perhaps that further evaluation could be warranted. So this is an area of interest um, and future evaluation. This has also been shown that um, neuromuscular training, including some cervical spine strengthening is protective of concussion in youth rugby players. So these are some intrinsic factors that are important to consider. So we know that people with a previous history of concussion have a greater risk of concussion, and perhaps there's more from a neuromuscular control standpoint that we should be considering. Then each player is susceptible to extrinsic risk factors such as equipment and rules of the game. And the sport, we know that contact sport has a greater risk of concussion. We've recently published a study that showed a 64% reduction in the odds of concussion when youth were wearing a mouth guard. And rules um, related to body checking have been shown to decrease the risk of concussion as well. Other sports we've seen in volleyball, 15% of concussions uh, occur in the warm up. So, Volleyball Canada uh, made a simple change to the warm up um, so that players would not be running underneath the net to go and get their ball um, and getting hit. Um, so, instead, the team stayed on the same side. Similarly, in youth soccer ball, we, youth soccer, we see that the majority of these injuries are due to player to player contact. So there might be more of a role for potentially using some of these strategies that we use for rehab to evaluate them in a prehabilitation standpoint. And that's part of a, or a national level study that we're doing evaluating the prevention of um, multiple different um, types of prevention programs in the top 11 sports high risk for concussion and high school players. And this study is also aligned with an international study that we have the pleasure of working with um, Dr. Patricius and his wonderful team um, at Wits University um, to look at the prevention, detection, and management of concussion in rugby, looking at things from a multi-system standpoint. And a lot of the work that you hear me talking about today in ice hockey, um, we're applying in a rugby context across different levels of play, um, from grassroots to the elite level, children and youth to adults, and across the spectrum of prevention detection and management. So the primary, secondary and tertiary prevention of concussion, ultimately so that we can optimize the prevention of concussion and optimize detection and management. So perhaps at a later date, I can share some results from this study with the team. So most of the time an athlete can play and there's a number of different events. You can see many, many events happen. There's no concussion, but at some point there's an inciting event and a concussion is suspected. And at this point, it's important to recognize and remove if a concussion may have occurred. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Concussion Recognition Tool 5 and the SCAT 5. Um, the Concussion Recognition Tool 5 can be used for all stakeholders at the sideline of a sporting pitch. 
um, and the STAT-5 is meant to, for use by healthcare professionals. In the event that a concussion is suspected, it's important to also reevaluate using a multifaceted assessment. So what areas are important to assess? Well, the SCAT um, and the HIA 1, 2, and 3 in rugby are important components of that assessment. But are there other areas that we should also consider assessing? We know that a multifaceted assessment is recommended and including evaluation of the cervical spine, visual system, balance, vestibular, and exertion systems. So what could we include for some of these assessments? Here's some of the work that we have recently done. Um, we looked at preseason performance on measures uh, that evaluate the cervical spine, vestibular ocular system, and divided attention and dynamic balance to look and see what some of these scores would be like in our youth athletes. And we've also recently looked at a wonderful undergraduate uh, student that I have the pleasure of working with, Robbie Graham, has recently looked to see if there's differences based on concussion history. And uh, we're further evaluating that at the current point in time. We've also found that over one year um, in youth ice hockey players, we see significant changes in measures of cervical spine strength, the ability to hold the head stationary when an external force is used to perturb it, and when walking and dividing attention. But we don't see change on some of our other measures. So perhaps when we're thinking of using different outcome measures, especially with developing athletes, we really need to think about the timing of when these systems are developing. We've recently finished this five-year cohort study and are currently in the process of evaluating uh, multiple years and change over time in these measures. We've also looked to see what happens with some of these measures following a concussion. And what's very interesting is that across the board that we saw that all measures of cervical spine function were significantly worse following um, concussion. And we didn't see any changes in our measures of dynamic visual acuity, which I'll talk a little bit more later and explain in more detail, our functional gait assessment, and our players were actually better on our walking while talking test. So they were better able to divide attention. Perhaps this was because of growth and development. So in the event that a concussion occurs, we know that there are multiple different symptoms that can occur. Across the literature, headache is the most commonly reported concussion. But we also see that dizziness is very commonly reported and is often the second most common symptom. Neck pain is also commonly reported and is often the fourth most commonly reported symptom. So what do we know from a dizziness standpoint? We'll start with the dizziness. I want you to take a moment and think about dizziness. Um, I love dizziness and differential diagnosis of diz dizziness, but some people don't really enjoy dizziness because there's so many different causes of dizziness and it can sometimes be a bit of an overwhelming symptom to deal with. So it's always important to think of all the different systems of the body and the different types of dizziness that may occur. The, the vestibular system, the inner ear could be a source of dizziness. Migraine type headaches, you could have a vestibular migraine. The cervical spine could be a source of dizziness. It tends to be a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, the central nervous system, multiple different areas of the brain are involved in balance and could result in dizziness. A lack of blood flow or a vascular event could result in dizziness. Psychogenic, um, dizziness is a very common um, symptom, but often it's a symptom that occurs secondary to an underlying primary dizziness disorder. Medication, dizziness is the second most common um, side effect often. And there are many other causes of dizziness as well. So it's not surprising because this is a complex um, symptom and there are multiple different types of dizziness. It could be a problem with just one of these areas but it could be that you, there's more than one type of dizziness as well. And then within each of these different types of dizziness, there's multiple different subcategories. So I'm gonna break dizziness down and talk a little bit more about a few of the different things that you could be considering when you're looking at dizziness.
So this is a picture of your labyrinth. So your vestibular labyrinth. It's a small membrane um, that's encased in temporal bone. Inside the red circle, this is your vestibular labyrinth. To the left of the red circle is your cochlea and your vestibulocochlear nerve. As you can see, this is not a real vestibular um, <laughs> system. However, it's a, it's a model. And these three semicircular canals are oriented at 90 degrees to one another. So each faces a different direction and senses motion in a different plane. So it helps you know which direction you're moving. Your posterior canal, which is this one back here, is in approximately the same plane as your ear. And then your anterior canal is 90 degrees from that. Your horizontal canal is tipped up just about 20 degrees with respect to gravity. Inside these canals is a fluid with a bundle of hairs at the end. So when you move your head in different directions, the fluid will move and tip the hairs one way or the other. And that will either cause an excitatory input or an inhibitory input, depending on which way you're moving. And the ears are paired so that each of the ears has a canal in the same direction. So that can help um, in the case of changes in, um, to help minimize changes in body, um, poor temperature, dehydration, and causing any dizziness. Inside this chamber-like area are your two otolith organs. And this is the part of the ear that senses tilting and tipping motions. So here there's a sensory membrane that has a bunch of hairs and calcium carbonate crystals on top encased in a gel. So when you're standing and you start to tilt or tip, the way to those crystals will bend the hairs and then send a message off to tell the brain which way you're moving. And then a message will get sent back up to straighten you back up again. Now there's a large mass of these crystals. So only a tiny bit of movement um, can send off that signal. And that really helps with that fine control of posture. <clears throat> now, many of us are familiar, very familiar with the vestibulospinal reflex, which helps keep us upright in space. But the vestibulo-ocular reflex is another area that is primary output from your vestibular system. So the vestibulo-ocular reflex helps with gaze stability. In other words, helps maintain your eye velocity the same and at the same and opposite direction of your head velocity so that they're equal and opposite so that you can see clearly when your head moves. So some patients might come in and say, gosh, I can't see clearly, but I've had my eyes checked and my eyes are fine. But it may actually be that it's when they're moving around, they cannot maintain their eyes stable on the target as their head is moving. If we think about sport, think about the high speed of motion and the amount of different directions that you have to move and be able to coordinate head and neck and eye motion to perform in sport, this is a vital reflex. And sometimes players will also report, this is one of my clinicalisms, I'll throw a couple of them in, I'm mostly basing this on the evidence, but uh, oftentimes they'll say, I'm not quite as sharp or I'm a little off. And uh, sometimes when you do some tests for the vestibulo-ocular reflex, it'll, it'll tease out some of those um, more difficult to describe symptoms. Um, so we'll chat a little bit more here. Um, most of the time, both your ears are gonna give the brain the same input about where you are in space. But in, in some cases, if there's trauma to the inner ear, or if there's a problem with information coming in from your inner ear, you're gonna get an imbalance in input coming from your peripheral vestibular apparatus to your central vestibular system. And what this is going to cause is vertigo or a sensation of spinning um, and movement of the environment and imbalance and often nausea at the same time. So acutely, there's a large mismatch between what the two ears are telling the brain. Um, but then over time, with recovery or with compensation, the brain starts to figure out um, which ear and which systems it should rely on more for input about where they are in space. So initially there's vertigo and then over time it might be just that there's lightheadedness with quick turns of the head. So the literature shows um, if we pull out um, people that have persisting dizziness approximately 10% show what appears to be a peripheral vestibular hypofunction. The exact mechanism by which this happens is not really well understood, but it's hypothesized 
that there's trauma to that labyrinth so that it doesn't function as well and sense motion as well. So in a normal situation, both ears would tell the brain the same thing. If, if you no longer have the input coming in from one side, the brain thinks, well, I must be turning towards the intact side. So the eyes would move to the side and then quickly reset to the middle. And then you'll see something called nystagmus. So if you have an acute problem where there's one you're not sensing motion as well as the other, you might see this type of eye movement, but it should be gone within um, a week or so. Um, we use some infrared blackout goggles so we can put the patient's eyes in the dark, but illuminate them with um, infrared light, which is outside the visible spectrum so that we can see what's happening with the eyes, but the patient is not able to fixate. So this is an example of what some horizontal nystagmus may look like. Sorry, the video is a little bit grainy. So you can see the eye slowly drifts and then flicks. So drifts to the right side of their head and flicks towards the left side. One way that one test that can be used, it's a, it's not a perfect test, but it's a nice quick clinical test that can be used. Um, and you should see this with a number of other tests as well. So you're really looking at a cluster of tests. Um, but the head thrust test is a common clinical test that's done in just a slight nod. And a key is that you do it unpredictably with a small amount of rotation. So it's a quick, tiny but quick head motion and the eye should stay fixated on a target. Let's say there wasn't proper input coming in from that right ear, the eyes might go at the head and quickly correct back instead of staying on the target as they should. So a negative test would be the eyes stay on the target. A positive test would be a corrective saccade observed toward the side of the thrust. So when you move towards the right, you would normally get an excitatory input from that right side. But if that right ear is not working and you turn towards the right side, there might be a delay with the eyes jumping over afterwards. So I have a video here that I'll just play for you. The head thrust test. So you can see small. Oh, the, the video is a little bit glitchy, so it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see his eyes stay focused on my nose. So that would be a normal head thrust test. So in the case that the head thrust test is positive, the eyes would move with the head and then correct back. Now I mentioned earlier um, a test for dynamic visual acuity. So this is a test that we, we use in some of our research as well. And it's a behavioral representative of the cerebrooocular reflex. So how well can an individual use that vestibulo-ocular reflex when they're functioning. The test is done using an ETDRS chart and the patient is situated 13 feet away from the target. Um, the head's just in a tiny bit of a nod and you set the metronome at two hertz. When you're moving it over 120 degrees per second, you're relying only on vestibular cues. When you move more slowly, you can rely on oculomotor or cervical ocular cues to help maintain the eye stable on a target. So you only need a tiny um, bit of head motion. So it's approximately 20 degrees of rotation, okay? And you set your metronome to, two, to 120 beats per second. And then every time the metronome beeps, you should be going back towards the same side. Before you add in head motion, you will ask the um, player or patient to read the lowest line that they can with their head still. And then you repeat the test with hot head motion. And you look to see how much they change with head motion. Normal is to lose two or less lines with head motion. This is another test where sometimes patients and athletes will report that this is what they mean when they're not quite as sharp or they can't quite see as well. And this test has been shown to be sensitivity, sensitive to change and also be responsive to rehab. And so when someone has a problem with that vestibulo-ocular reflex, 
will use exercises called adaptation exercises, which I'll explain in a little more detail later on. This video has an explanation of dynamic visual the acuity, but I'm gonna come right to the end here. Oh, let's see, I'll come back a little further. That video was in my lab when we, could, uh, when we could go into the lab. <laughs> um, so that's an example of dynamic visual acuity. You can see we don't really need a large amount of head motion, but you do need to go to the left and to the right. It won't tell you what side there's a challenge with, but it'll tell you, give you a behavioral idea of how well the individual is functioning with head motion in the horizontal plane. Um, Another condition from a vestibular standpoint that can be seen following trauma and following concussion is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo or BPPV, where the crystals from in the autolith or that chamber area um, or debris are believed to be dislodged into one of the semicircular canals, which makes them um, responsive to gravity. So what happens is after you move into a plane that causes fluid flow in the canal, the fluid will move and stop, but then the crystals continue to move and continue to move the fluid and cause an excitatory input in the canal um, where there's a problem. So to assess for this, we use a Dix Hall Pike or a Hall Pike Dix test. And essentially what you're doing is moving the body into a plane where we're causing lots of fluid flow through the affected or the potentially affected canal. The really neat part is that because each of the canals has a direct link with some of the eye muscles, we'll see eye movement that tells us which canal the crystals are in or the debris is in, and that tells us which type of treatment maneuver is needed. Um, and typically, um, the majority of cases, um, the problems in the posterior canal, um, but in some cases, we can see some in the anterior horizontal canal, and there's about 18 different variants that may be um, present. If we look at the literature following sport-related concussions, some of the research we've done, some of the research that um, uh, Al Salahi and al have published, um, approximately 5% of individuals with persisting dizziness um, have positive tests suggesting benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And the good thing is, is that there's just a wealth of literature to show that this um, type of a mechanical problem in the inner ear can be treated effectively in as few as one treatment um, and typically requires one to three treatments. If you're requiring more than three treatments, you really should question your diagnosis and look to see if there's something else going on. So essentially your patient is in long sitting the head is rotated 45 degrees, and the goal of that is to get in the plane of the, of the canal that you're testing. So if you were turning to the right, you'd be in the plane of the right posterior canal, and then you lay down, so you're causing a lot of fluid flow through that posterior canal on the right. When you get down into the test position, you should see a characteristic pattern of nystagmus. The patient um, should have a reproduction of vertigo, and that would be a positive test for BPPD. The nystagmus is typically brief in duration and occurs at the same time as the patient feels symptomatic. Um, in the case of neck pain, you can test individuals for BPPV and I'll often have them just put their hands around their head and their neck and I'll use their elbows to guide them down into the test position. Um, so you can do it with a neutral neck position as well. So here's a video, it's actually quite loud. This lady um, has quite the uh, response. I'll just turn the audio off, um, but you can see um, here she is. She's going down into the test position right about now. There we go, and now she's down there. And you can see with her eye, you can see her eyelid flickering. She closed her eyes there. So what you can see there's an upbeating left torsional. So there's a bit of a twist and an up. And when you're looking at these videos, you always want to think of it in relation to the patient's head. So you see there was a big burst of eye movement and then it slowed down and now it's stopped and there's no more eye movement. So that's the type of eye movement that would be consistent with BPPV in the posterior canal. 
Now it's important to also recognize that there's many other types of nystagmus that may be seen. And these suggest potentially central um, or more brain that's involved as opposed to a peripheral vestibular problem. And so it's important to know who in your area has expertise from a vestibular standpoint I mean, could help with evaluation of these different tests and measures. There's really good literature to show that vestibular rehabilitation works well for BPPV and works well for people that have unilateral peripheral vestibular hypofunction. Um, but in many cases, patients may need to be medically managed and it's important to have those links and those collaborative relationships um, to refer your patient um, in the case that perhaps it's a, it's a problem that may require further medical evaluation. And I'm giving you the crash course in just a couple of quick tests, but really it's a, it's a very detailed examination that's done. But these are some of the more common types of problems that you may see. Um, on this page, I'm showing you a list of, uh, it, this comes from our pediatric um, guideline for the treatment of mild traumatic brain injury. And it's a living guideline. And there's a link to it on the sheet that will be shared with you. And essentially on here, you can see all the different domains. And then you can click on the domain of interest. And there is a list of different tools and resources. So some of the different videos that I've just shown you, you can actually pull up here. And this is a tool that was um, put out by the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation. Um, and um, it, is, it is a Canadian based tool, um, but there might be some useful resources that you have here. This is also a link to our toolkit, um, our Physiotherapy Alberta, which is the province that I live in in Canada. Um, and it's a toolkit with link to, links to a variety of different resources related to the physiotherapy management of concussion. Um, and we did update this. We created an initial toolkit um, before the fifth consensus and then update it following the fifth consensus. And we'll do so again after the sixth consensus meeting. So what if we talk about headache and neck pain? These are also very commonly occurring symptoms. We know that in some cases, the cervical spine can be involved and may give us neck pain, headaches, dizziness, and there's a number of different structures that could be the source of pain and dysfunction. Could be related to the joints. We know the C23 joint um, is a source of cervicogenic headaches. It's the same thing with the C12. Um, there could be myofascial structures causing pain, multiple different areas. And it's important to also think of potential involvement from a psychological distress standpoint. There's a ton of proprioceptive input that comes in from the upper cervical spine as well. So really important to think of this from a um, sensory motor standpoint as well, and not forget about the proprioceptive contributions of the upper neck from a balance standpoint. And um, Julia Trelevin has done a lot, tremendous amount of work in this area and there are some great resources um, if you want to read further on this. And oftentimes the cervical spine and concussion can occur concurrently. Just because you have cervical spine findings doesn't mean that there's no concussion and vice versa. Oftentimes we might see that the two um, occur concurrently. And right now we don't really have a good test that says no, it's just your neck or no, it's just a concussion. And some of what we see from a rehab standpoint is as we treat the neck and the neck improves, a lot of the symptoms resolve, but individuals are still managed as though they had a concussion. So it's really important to not think that cervical involvement means there's no concussion. From an assessment of the cervical spine standpoint, we won't have time to go through everything here, but certainly your typical range of motion, cervical spine screening, biomechanical exam, and a number of different tests that look at neuromotor control as well as sensory motor control can help you know what area of the cervical spine may need to be targeted. And there's also a multitude of other measures, but these are some of the measures that we've used in some of our research studies. Um, when we think of assessing sensory motor control, evaluating cervical proprioception, so using a joint, evaluating joint position sense and cervical movement accuracy, as well as postural control and eye movement control. 
And here you can already start to see some overlap with some of the things that we talked about from a vestibular standpoint. Your rehab will really be informed by an identified functional impairment. And again, multifaceted. And this is really why uh, initially that got me really interested in this area because I did some certification vestibular rehabilitation, did some additional training um, and did all my manual therapy certification. And a lot of the athletes that I saw actually had a little bit of both going on. So perhaps we need to think of all these systems together um, and think about how the systems interact in order to best facilitate recovery. One note here, this is some of the work that my husband, Jeff Schneider has done, looking at prediction rules for facet joint mediated pain in the neck um, and showing that individuals that have a positive manual spinal exam, palpation for segmental tenderness and extension rotation test um, are highly likely to have facet joint mediated pain in the neck if at least a three out of 10 typical pain is reproduced on testing. Um, and this was when these clinical tests were compare, compared to response to the gold standard placebo control um, medial branch blocks at the affected level. Um, so we do know in whiplash that facet joint mediated pain is a common, common source of persistent neck pain. Um, and in some individuals with persisting pain following concussion, um, this is an area that I think requires further evaluation because we do tend to see that this could be an important area um, and some clinical tests that might be a benefit for you. So headache is your most common symptom following concussion. And this up to 95% of individuals that suffer a concussion may report a post-traumatic headache. So a post-traumatic headache is a secondary headache that's attributed to injury when your new headache occurs following trauma but it must occur within seven days of trauma. For some individuals, they might have a pre-existing headache that worsens or becomes persistent. So those individuals may have a primary headache diagnosis in addition to a post-traumatic headache diagnosis. And of interest, we just had a paper published looking at um, over 3,000 youth ice hockey players that participated in uh, the cohort studies I mentioned earlier and reports of a headache of greater than three um, on the zero to six scale on this that's part of the symptom reports on the SCAT was predictive of longer term recovery. There are many different types of headaches that have been reported following concussion. So a migraine headache with or without aura. Um, there are a number of studies that are demonstrating similarities in some of the post-traumatic headaches um, to migraineous headaches tension type headaches, cervicogenic headaches, occipital neuralgia, medication overuse, and mixed headache types, among others. These are just some of the most commonly reported in the literature. But oftentimes headaches are grouped as a whole, similar to dizziness, similar to neck pain, and not really looked at um, from a specific standpoint. And an appropriate headache diagnosis can help direct management because there's actually quite a bit of literature for some of these different types of headaches that demonstrates a positive outcome. I thought it was also important to mention, I know I'm focusing on cervical and vestibular systems, but also important to think of the exertion and physical exertion, because our athletes are returning to sports where they're gonna be doing physical exertion. And um, I've had a few different uh, graduate students looking at some different uh, tests and measures in this area um, we recently published a paper looking at different symptoms that are responsible for treadmill test cessation. And uh, headache and dizziness and pressure in the head were um, the most common symptoms responsible for test cessation. And the majority of individuals no longer had symptom provocation um, six to 12 hours following the test. We also compared the Buffalo concussion treadmill test to a cycling test of exertion. Um, and this is currently impressed with the Journal of Athletic Therapy, um, but found that the athletic training, my apologies, but we did find that the two tests were quite similar, but in some cases provoked different symptoms. So depending on the persistent symptom, you may want to think of different types of training modalities and testing modalities to evaluate exertion. And then also think about um, looking at field-based tests, as these are often done with many different tests. And thinking of the sport specificity. And when we're thinking of the sensory motor system, 
and we're thinking of how these athletes are going to be functioning, we also want to think of the sensory motor stimulus for each of these tests and what systems do we want to be challenging. Um, and we know there's a physiological um, response to exercise, but if you're walking on a treadmill, there's also a mismatch coming in where your head is stationary, but your legs are moving. So you're inducing a little bit of a mismatch. So could we also be thinking about not only physical exertion, but also sensory motor stimulus in alignment with this. Um, I thought it was interesting just to also mention some of the work that Julie Hides has done, um, looking at uh, sensory motor function changes following um, sport-related concussion and finding a decrease in sway velocity and an increased size and contraction of the trunk muscles. So a splinting um, or essentially overholding um, following concussion in that early time period. So perhaps looking more um, at the trunk itself from a stability standpoint. And we're continuing to look at this um, and a number of these different measures in our strike concussion study and in our international rugby study so that we can look at all of these measures together and how do they affect one another and how does this potentially affect recovery? I'm just gonna highlight a couple of uh, points um, from a few of the other studies that we're just um, completing. Um, we have an international trial looking at the vestibulo-ocular and oculomotor consequences of concussion across the spectrum of mild, moderate, and severe traumatic brain injury. And um, one of our initial publications uh, by Gilad Sarak um, at uh, the University of Tel Aviv uh, in Israel um, finding that um, there's quite an intricate relationship between the vestibulo-ocular reflex um, and autonomic nervous system control. And then we've also been looking at heat, cold, and pressure pain thresholds following sport-related concussion and comparing that to healthy and orthopedic controls. And this is the work of uh, Orson Johnstone, who recently completed his master's. Um, and while not significant, um, finding that there is, in general, um, across the board, the threshold seemed to be somewhat diminished compared to um, orthopedic control and healthy controls. So an area for future evaluation. And while I'm focusing on cervical and vestibular um, aspects of concussion, I always think that it's really important to bring it back to the whole person. And this is one piece and one piece that falls within the expertise that I have but there's also an important team um, and important to engage the interdisciplinary team and think of all the different areas that may require management. In many cases, it might just be one area that requires treatment, but in other cases, it might be important to reach out to others. So from a management standpoint, uh, we know that an initial period of rest for 24 to 48 hours is recommended um, and rehabilitation. Um, I'll talk about that in a second consideration of referral, evaluation for recovery, and a graduated process of returning to sport is what's recommended. So I'm just going to ask, and there are, there is, uh, I'm going to give you a heads up, there is noise that will come on with the answer to this question. This is a myth buster. I like to use myth busters, especially partly through presentation. Um, I can't see your faces, but I want you to take a think here. Truth or myth? Manual therapy and soft tissue techniques are the key components to rehab following concussion. So an individualized, multifaceted, targeted approach, focusing on sensory motor and neuromotor control, but including manual therapy and soft tissue techniques as indicated appears to facilitate recovery. It's not just the hands-on work. And this is a common question that I get from a lot of clinicians. So I include it as a, a myth buster here, because yes, in some cases, you know what, if there is a joint that requires some manual therapy um, and some soft tissue work, that's of course an important component of rehab, but a lot of the rehab um, does appear to be very multifaceted in combining that sensory motor and neuromotor control. Um, we published this systematic review alongside uh, the last consensus on concussion in sport. Um, and uh, a key output here was that you just need the 24 to 48 hours of rest and then gradually reintroduce your activities of daily living and start to get moving again. In the event that there's ongoing symptoms, there's evidence to support the use of cervical and vestibular physiotherapy, cognitive therapy, and low-level aerobic exercise. 
And at this point, actually, there was some discrepancy in the literature about low level aerobic exercise, but this has really evolved over time. And some new randomized control trials have been published to show positive outcomes from sub-symptom threshold aerobic exercise. And for the individuals that don't recover, that multifaceted assessment for targeted treatment and consideration of a multidisciplinary and collaborative team to facilitate recovery is warranted. A challenge is that there are not a lot of studies to go on. Um, and some of the research doesn't include a control group and hasn't been done in a randomized way. So over time, there are more and more trials that have evolved, which is wonderful. And this can help us best understand the optimal way to manage concussions. So I added this slide in because I thought it was quite interesting. And uh, this is my very first poster at a scientific conference. And it's a case series of professional athletes um, that I worked with and national team athletes that had at the time termed complex concussions. We don't use this term anymore. And uh, it was published in the Clinical Journal of Sport Medicine. And I presented it at our Canadian Academy of Sport and Exercise Medicine. And at the time it was uh, still a time where the rest was really the recommendation. And this was taking a really different approach to be more active in terms of rehab. So um, this was my initial um, publication. And uh, a lot of the athletes that I worked with had said, well, I think actually maybe my performance is better too. So perhaps we should also be measuring performance. And that's uh, an area that uh, I'm starting to do some more work in now. So that was the impetus for me to do then my PhD, um, looking at the effects of combining cervical and vestibular rehabilitation. And so we included individuals between the ages of 12 and 30 that had persisting symptoms of dizziness, neck pain, and or headaches following sport-related concussion. And they were randomized to either a um, control group that was the standard of rest followed by gradual exertion or a treatment group that was an individualized, multifaceted um, cervical and vestibular rehab program, depending on what their clinical evaluation demonstrated. And here in this arrow, you can see, sorry, it's covered by the picture, um, but what you can see is there is a significant difference between the two groups. Um, the red line is the treatment group and the blue line is the control group. And this is a survival analysis here. And what we are doing is comparing the proportion that were recovered at the eight week time period following treatment initiation. And each step would represent an individual being medically cleared. So you can see we only had one person in the control group medically cleared. We had 73% of the um, individuals in the treatment group medically cleared. So the individuals in the treatment group were 10 times more likely to be medically cleared but we did have um, two individuals drop out. And if we assume they recovered, then our individuals in our treatment group would be just under four times more likely to be medically cleared in that eight week time period. Um, and we then offered to the participants that they could flip flop into the opposite treatment group. And what we saw was 33% of the individuals that moved from the control group into the treatment group um, were medically cleared and no one from the control group um, was medically cleared within that eight week time point. So perhaps there's a timing effect and earlier treatment is better, but we also had only our most severe, severely symptomatic groups um, choose to flip into the opposite treatment groups. So really we need future study to look at different time points post injury and the effects of treatment. In this study, our median time post injury was 53 days um, but we did start at 10 days post-injury. Another um, randomized control trial was recently published by Jen Reniker and her team, and uh, looking at early multifaceted physiotherapy for dizziness after sport-related concussion, and they randomized individuals into either a cervico-vestibular physiotherapy group or a subtherapeutic group um, that included exercises that were not meant to improve function. And what was found was that the experimental group recovered um, 2.91 times faster than the control group. So similar to our results. So what is vestibular rehabilitation? Well, some of you may be familiar with this, so I'll apologize. I'm just gonna go through each one in a little bit of detail. 
um, but this might be new to some of you. So vestibular rehabilitation includes a number of different treatments depending on the patient's presentation. And the treatment is individualized based on the impairments that are seen on evaluation. With the exception of a cantilever repositioning maneuver, which is used for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And essentially we take the, whoop, Oh, my, my PowerPoint just quit. I'll just open it back up again. My apologies. So with um, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, they're treated with um, what's called an epiline maneuver. And that epiline maneuver um, will treat um, the most common types of BPPD. However, it won't treat um, the horizontal canals and some of the more rare types of benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And so the most common type of maneuver would be the epi, but there's a number of different types as well that could be, um, could be used. Okay, I'm just going to restart again here. I think I'm gonna skip playing the videos here. It might be the video. It's when I clicked on the video, it closed out on me. Going to do 180 turn towards your right. So you're going to turn, yes, start here, and quickly line. turn to face the wall behind you. So this is an example of a habituation exercise where we're essentially having our patient. My friend, can you start again? Can you just share your screen again? I think oh, it's. Uh, my apologies. Thanks. Right, we're on again. Thank you. Got it? Okay, my apologies. Sorry about that. Um, now we're going to do 180 turn towards your right. So you're going to turn, start. Here's our example of a habituation exercise. So you can have patients turn in different directions. And the goal is to desensitize them to the motions that are prov provocative of symptoms. Gaze stability training I mentioned earlier can be used um, for individuals that are having difficulty with their vestibular ocular reflex. So essentially here what we're doing is he's focusing on a target and turning his head. Now, right now he's moving fairly slowly, but he'll gradually progress to faster and faster head motions. And then you can also change the plane that you're training in. And then you can also change the target um, to move into different directions. And then you can also move into sport specific planes of motion um, and have players working on this in their environment. Static and dynamic balance training, I think most of you are probably quite familiar with. Um, but if we think about typical balance testing when you're just standing still, you're not going to be doing the typical movements or coordination of multiple different types of movements that you may be doing in everyday life. So even the video in the top right, where the where she's walking and turning her head, um, incorporates eyes also moving with the head so she can't use the visual cues to tell her where straight ahead is. Playing catch, looking up and down, quick changes of direction um, can also be included. And then substitution is where um, if an individual is unable to rely on vestibular cues, you start to work on uptraining some of the other systems so they can rely more heavily on those other systems. From a cervical spine standpoint, there's a lot of evidence that shows that a multimodal approach, including both manual therapy and exercise, including specific exercises um, for head on neck control and that neural motor control, as well as including sensory motor control, um, has positive outcomes for treating cervical spine involvement. And that's largely what a lot of our rehabilitation is, is aimed at. Um, oftentimes, once players or patients start to feel better, um, their symptoms improve, but then there tends to be a bit of a gap between where they finish rehab and where they need to be to return to sport. So it's important to also think of all the different environments that they need to be in. And a lot of these exercises are context specific, meaning that individuals need to train and play in the environment that they're going to be competing in. 
in order to make these adaptations and get used to integrating sensory stimuli. So things like a plain back background versus a busy visual environment or a distracted environment. Um, alter the afferent input that's coming in and combinations. Um, so I like this example here. This is my son's hockey team. Got to go um, to a professional hockey team and be a, at one of the intermissions, they did an obstacle course. Well, these are like nine-year-olds that have not necessarily been skating much in a dim area and they're under a spotlight and jumping over top of things with lights flashing. So a very different environment for them to have to try and perform in. Different surfaces. Here's a volleyball example with lights overhead. So they're going to have to sort out that visual source when it's dark. Um, this is me at the Hockey Hall of Fame pretending I'm a hockey goalie. And um, it's definitely, uh, you had to wear some protective eyewear that you couldn't see very well out of. So just think of all the different ways that you might change the environment. Um, and remember that repeated exposure, deliberate practice and context specificity is really important. In general, you wanna start least provocative to most provocative. Different um, patients and athletes will have different tolerance levels and then gradually adapt over time. Um, and listen to your athletes, they will usually tell you where you need to go. They'll tell you what they have trouble with and that can help you target your assessment. Um, and I did mention this early, but I put this slide in here to make sure I didn't forget that um, certainly the sub-symptom threshold aerobic exercise is also a key component and actually will incorporate a lot of sensory motor stimulus as well. So I have had some patients that say, oh, I, I get symptoms when I go on the bike and they're sitting in the bike in a really difficult position for their neck. And as soon as we get them into a better position, they can function better. There's not a lot of evidence on that, but from a clinical standpoint, I think it's important to recognize. And then also just thinking of all the different systems and all the different areas um, that need to be evaluated. I haven't spoken specifically about some of the visual components, but certainly if there is visual involvement, considering what else might, might, might be warranted, um, mood and mental health uh, concerns, sleep um, and cognitive function are all important as well. Um, and combining treatments together and working collaboratively with other healthcare professionals is, is so important. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Brian Brooks, is a pediatric neuropsychologist at our children's hospital just down the road um, and did find some positive effects when um, doing cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia following mild traumatic brain injury. So another type of treatment that might be a benefit. When we think of returning to sport, um, it's important to think of returning to school, returning to sport together. Um, these two can be done simultaneously. Uh, some of the work that we recently published um, looked at the association between moderate and vis vigorous physical activity um, and the individuals that spent more than 45 minutes in moderate and vigorous physical activity in the early time period following diagnosis actually took longer to recover and this really aligns with the return to sport strategy. Um, and another component to think about is depending on the sport that you're working with, where does risk come into play? In some cases, that's when you're going to full contact practice. In other cases, that might be when you're doing sport specific exercise, if there's risk of fall. So just important to think of these factors as you're working with your athletes. I've had the pleasure of working with our National um, Injury Prevention Association, um, which has led the harmonization of national concussion pro uh, protocols in Canada. And the national sport organizations, we've worked with them to develop sport specific return to sport strategies for many of our national sport organizations. They're all posted on the parachute website if you'd like to go and look at them. So they're essentially based on the outputs from the fifth consensus and the return to sports strategy, but additional detail related to sports specific considerations are there. And I'm sure you're all well aware of World Rugby Concussion Management and the box spark um, work that has been done. Um, and so from a return to activity standpoint, an individual should be asymptomatic at rest and with graduated return to sport and no other clinical findings suggesting an inability to return and I'll often have the physicians that I work with say to me, okay, Kath, so is there anything else that you've tested that you think isn't quite recovered yet? 
And 10, 12 years ago, I'd have players saying, am I ready to go? And now they say, have you checked everything that you need to check? And I think, you know, we, over time, we're learning more and more um, and we still have more, we still have a ways to go, but currently a comprehensive examination to ensure that we're using objective testing wherever we can to help inform those decisions is really important in working with that team. Um, to date, there's still no physiological time window for sport-related concussion recovery. And we do know that physiological dysfunction could outlast clinical measures of recovery. So that buffer zone of gradually increasing activity prior to contact is appropriate. And in many sports, as players start to go through the return to sports strategy, this is sometimes the first time they've been exposed to some of the sensory motor stimulus. So it might actually be that there's a targeted area where we need to work on rehabbing from a cervical vestibular standpoint that can help facilitate that return to sports strategy. Um, so important to think about what other areas could we take a look at. And there is some evidence to show that there's an increased risk of injury and increased risk of concussion following previous concussion. Um, so thinking about how we define recovery and are there any other pieces that we should be evaluating is important. And then when a player returns to play, they're gonna to continue to adapt through repeat participation, but now they're gonna have a history of concussion. So that changes their risk when you think of it through this whole um, uh, recursive model. And one thing that um, has been said to me by a number of athletes, and I mentioned it earlier, is that sometimes they find following a concussion when they go back, they actually feel from doing a lot of this training um, and rehabilitation exercises that they're um, perhaps better than they were before. And uh, so I think also thinking about how do we facilitate um, that recovery and return to performance and getting back to sport when they're feeling confident is also a key piece. I mentioned that we've had a Canadian um, emphasis to adapt the international consensus to our Canadian context. Um, and we've worked with um, our national sport organizations and it's been driven by our, our federal government um, to develop these different um, concussion related protocols and processes um, and to help improve the safety of athletes. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working with this group and I, I've uh, had my researcher hat saying, we should evaluate this, we should evaluate this. So that's what we did. We evaluated this Canadian harmonization process in Canada. And um, we surveyed all our national sport organizations from grassroots to um, high performance. And what's interesting is that there's an ongoing difficulty um, that is voiced um, with a challenge regarding access to physicians and nurse practitioners for diagnosis and management. And there's also challenges accessing healthcare professionals with specific expertise when symptoms persist, even at a, a national level. Um, so I think this is an important uh, point and perhaps it's different in South Africa, but I know it's something that has been uh, voiced here. And uh, we're now in the process of developing a toolkit um, that will be launched shortly to address the key challenges um, that were identified to help optimize implementation of concussion protocols. And I also wanted to highlight our massive open online course in concussion. We're going to run another one in the fall of 2021 if you're interested. And we are very fortunate to have contributors from around the globe speaking in their area of expertise. And Dr. Patricia's um, has also contributed content to this course. So thank you so much, uh, John, for your wonderful contributions um, and your contributions to the course uh, and making it uh, a real international course and uh, contributing to that success. So thanks so much. And we originally had our sixth international consensus conference on concussion and sport planned for October of 2020, which was pushed back to October of 2021. And if you look at the website now, you will see that the conference has again been pushed back to um, 2022. So you can stay tuned on the website for further updates as they come available. Um, and we do hope to see many of you there and uh, submit your abstracts um, as well. <laughs>
So I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you very much to all of you and all of our um, funding sources and a huge thank you to our team. Uh, we have a large team here at the University of Calgary and uh, really fortunate to work with such wonderful people. Um, and this is a photo that we took on our retreat last year. Um, it's out in Banff National Park. We were at the Banff Center. Um, and uh, so if you're ever in the area and want to stop by and say hello, I would uh, love to chat with you. So I think I'll finish off there and unshare my screen. And I think we have a few minutes left for questions there. Catherine, absolutely superb talk. Uh, apart from the lots of questions coming through, lots of comments, thanking you for the presentation, thanking you for uh, your MOOCs and courses and for the resources that, that have been posted already on our group. So thank you very much for all the preparation that went into that. It was really, really very insightful. And the type of in-depth uh, presentation that just reminds you that there's so much that one has to learn and put into practice uh, each day and how complex this field is. So thanks very much for highlighting that and bringing your expertise to us as well. Uh, we have got a few, few minutes for questions. So I'm going to start with some of those that have been posted and some of those sent to me. Craig Small, who's one of our physiotherapists that does a lot of work with our school kids, uh, a lot of the good concussion work, has asked how often you see BPPV in high school athletes after concussion. He sees it mostly in older patients. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say it, it is, I would agree with you, it is more rare in younger um, athletes and often in children and youth, um, it's, it's a rare condition. Um, the exact number, I'm not sure, but I actually um, recently saw a 13-year-old uh, patient that had BBBV, and um, it's much less common than it is. Um, in older adults, it's quite common. It's one of the most common causes of vertigo, um, but it's much less common in youth. And if we look across the studies um, in concussion, there's not a lot, but if we look at of the individuals presenting to a clinic um, with persisting dizziness, about 5% of the time they will have BPPV. And is there a way you can distinguish which of the canals is most likely involved in BPPV or is your management, your assessment and management pretty much the same? Now that's an excellent question. So depending on the canal that's affected, you're going to see an eye movement that goes in a different direction. So the direction of eye movement in the position tested is going to direct you to the type of treatment that you're going to use. Um, so the posterior canal, you'll see an upbeating torsional nystagmus towards that ear. If it's an anterior canal, it's going to be a downbeating torsional. Um, and if it's horizontal canal, you're going to see one of many different types of horizontal um, eye movements. In terms of the head thrust technique, do you usually wait for neck pain to settle or treat cervicogenic pain before you try that technique? Yeah, another excellent question. Um, I forgot to mention this, so thank you for bringing that up. For um, the head thrust test, I mean, initially we would screen the cervical spine first, um, most certainly. Um, you don't need to have a lot of head motion. So if it's someone that has mild cervical spine pain and the rest of their clinical evaluation looks quite good, um, I will sometimes actually thrust towards the center. So you start in a five to 10 degrees rotation and come back to center. The challenge with it is you have to remember where you started because if you see a positive test, you're gonna be in the center. You're not necessarily going to know which way you've thrusted. So you just have to make a mental note to remember where you're starting each time um, in the event you see a positive test. Um, but again, you're looking for a cluster of tests, so it might not be that you just have a positive head thrust test. Um, you'll see often some nystagmus with specific eye movements um, in your screening um, in combination of other challenges with balance. So you're going to see kind of a cluster of symptoms. So I would say it's one quick test, um, but shouldn't be used as a standalone test. 
And then just the last question on, on neck issues, the cervical extensor endurance test, do you use that as part of your neck assessment? Yeah, that's a great question. I do, um, and I will use it depending on the um, patient and um, in different sports, certainly with rugby. Um, it's, a, it's a test that I find quite useful. Um, and it is a test that I is a useful test to include in your exam. Most people can actually maintain that position for, for quite a while. So you also wanna just think about the time um, in terms of timing it. Yeah, but it is a useful test. Great. And we, we always like visitors to these presentations from far and wide. So it's lovely to see the former head of athletic medicine at Princeton University, my colleague and friend, Margot Putukin, who sent a question to you, firstly saying excellent presentation and asking you to comment on the utility of some of the ocular motor testing acutely on the sideline. She says that perhaps near point convergence may be useful, but are there any others that you might use on the sideline? Well, thanks for your question, Margo, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, that's a really great question. Um, I think it's, a, it's an area that there's a lot of research on going with. Um, there's a couple of different tests that have been reported as potentially useful on the sideline. Um, I can't comment in detail on which one specifically, but I think looking at oculomotor function more from a screening standpoint, but also recognizing that in some cases, individuals have problems with oculomotor function um, pre-injury as well. So understanding that that could be a common, uh, that also could be a finding. Um, but I think this is an important area where we may see some advances in, in the future in terms of sideline evaluation and screening. And then a question about balance testing uh, using uh, instrumentation, uh, stabilometer. Would it be useful? Is it something you use in baseline and return to play assessments? Yeah, I think it's a great question. So any, when we can quantify our assessment better, um, that's always quite useful. Um, a lot of the testing that um, is done is sometimes done in the field. So sometimes difficult to have um, greater quantification. Um, there are a number of different tools available and some of the recent research that's been done has shown that perhaps the um, size of an ellipse when you're looking at the quantity of sway um, might be useful. Um, and again, I think this is an area of ongoing evaluation and the question around reliability and consistency of those measures. And, would you consistently get the same measure over time? And how does that differentiate from a pre-injury status is, uh, is an important one. Great, and then a comment again from someone in this country who's contributing a lot to the rehabilitation is a lady just uh, north of us here called Deirdre de Jong, who's done a lot of work on ocular assessments and rehabilitation. And she's just commenting on the importance of integrating your ocular and your vestibular assessments looking at binocular function, inaccurate visual spatial relationships, and disrupted central peripheral visual integration. And this is a fascinating field. Deirdre gave a talk on one of our groups and, and focused very much on the ocular side. So your, your two talks have really, you know, married each other very well. So she's just commenting on how much she's learned. So thank you very much for adding to that. And then I think the last question here, do you send patients for vestibular testing who have persistent symptoms? When do you make that call? Uh, I think is, is asking here, when do, you, when do you make that call that the symptoms are becoming persistent that they actually need specific vestibular evaluation? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so your point before, um, sounds like we need to connect you directly. Um, and chat because uh, I, I work closely with a lot of um, our uh, neuro optometrists um, in the area and it's always great to work together and very important points there so I'd love to connect. I'll, um, I'll, I'll take, take, uh, take it upon myself to set that up so we'll, we'll make that happen. Thank you John. 
Um, and then the question about when do you send for vestibular testing? Um, if, if I see something on screening that makes me think that there's something more sinister going on or that there potentially is um, a different type of vestibular disorder going on that doesn't respond to physiotherapy treatment or that wouldn't be, that would be um, indicated for medical management, I would send them off right away. Um, and in the case that they're not recovering, I work with an interdisciplinary team. And so as soon as we're not really seeing progress, um, I typically will see people four to six times. And if we're not seeing that progress, then we look at, okay, what other factors might be affecting recovery that we might also need to look into. So I think early on um, is, is always good. Um, and a lot of the time we can do a consult as well with one of our um, colleagues uh, to get some further input on that. But I think, yeah, I, I would refer, if you're not seeing a lot of change in the initial four to six weeks, I would, I would follow up and or if there's any flags suggesting that there might be another cause to their symptoms, I would have further investigation at that time. Great, and the, and the last question, a lot of the symptoms that you've mentioned, a lot of the signs that you might pick up, do you find that these are heightened, particularly in young patients who have, suffer from, who have a history of anxiety and depression? And if so, do you think that managing that early on impacts on prognosis? Mm. That's a great question. Um, I would say that, yes, I think that that's an important aspect and important to recognize those factors. Um, obviously not my specific area of expertise, um, but one thing that I think is really important when we're doing this type of rehab also is that it can be anxiety producing sometimes the kids will come in for rehab and, and be totally stressed because they're worried that you're going to make them really dizzy or make their symptoms worse. So I think taking an approach of actually facilitating that process of um, empowering the patient to actually understand this is the rationale, this is what you can expect, here's your stopping, here's your criteria for pushing harder, here's your stopping criteria, I've found to be quite useful, especially in some of these patients that have a lot of anxiety because then they have some boundaries within which to work, but I'll usually work very closely with their healthcare team um, to have those aspects addressed early on. Sorry, I'm gonna throw in one more just from a, a very experienced physiotherapist we have called TJ Malhaba, who's asked about patients who wear glasses, contact lenses or hearing aids. Do you find them more difficult to evaluate? Does that change your approach at all? Mm, that's a great question. I think recognizing that this, that you know, those factors are present and, and could affect um, your ability to test. Sometimes you have to be really careful getting your hands close to a hearing aid. You're going to make it um, buzz and be very uncomfortable for the patients. Um, so adjusting some of the, the handholds. Um, similarly with glasses, when I'm doing some dynamic visual acuity testing. If they come in with their glasses on, I'll split my fingers over the arm of the glasses so as not to touch them. Um, in older patients, if they have a progressive lens, it's very hard to do the dynamic visual acuity testing. If you move out of the, you need to really stay in that same plane. In general, if they come in with glasses on, we keep glasses on. Um, but you could consider, um, in some cases, having them remove the glasses, but you want to wait five to 10 minutes before you do any of the testing um, prior to. So in some cases I find it challenging. In other cases, I just need to be really mindful of my handholds. Um, but I think it's a good point as well, because one thing we didn't mention today is the importance of auditory cues. So sometimes if you're having more difficulty with vestibular, or visual, or proprioceptive cues, you might become more reliant on auditory cues as well. Okay, I'm definitely going to wrap it up there. It was a most, most wonderful session and I see every participant has stayed on right until the end. So thanks, Catherine, for giving up your late morning to join us uh, here in our early evening. Uh, really, really was very informative and I think a lot of people appreciated putting a face to uh, a lot of the work they've read and a lot of the information that they've incorporated into clinical practice. So. Thanks for your contribution to the field and from Wits University, thanks very much for uh, being with us this evening. We really, really enjoyed it.
Well, thanks so much. And a big thank you to everyone that uh, attended the call. Really appreciate your active participation and your questions. And big thanks to you, John, for uh, all your work in organizing and moderating the session. Um, and to you as well, um, Dr. Seggers and uh, to Nadine as well uh, for all of, the, all of the help with the process. Thanks so much. We will see you soon. <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks it's another that. Zoom call soon, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, Robin's going to put up a slide now. We've actually got another concussion talk coming up next month. Uh, and this is going to focus a little bit more on women in concussion. Uh, it's co-hosted with the She Power in Sport group. So we really encourage you to join us for that. And, and hopefully we uh, share a bit of information on the impact on our female athletes of sports related concussion. So we look forward to you joining us there. We will post the resources which uh, Dr. Schneider has kindly shared with us. We, they are on the WhatsApp group. We will post them on the WISH website as well. So please go there and uh, make use of those very useful resources. Join us on the 22nd of June. Thanks again to Robin. Thanks to Asino Lita Pharmaceuticals for supporting us, for our colleagues at SASMA who help us promote these talks and co-host these talks. We really are proud to do this with you and we look forward to the talks that we have in the coming months. Have a good evening, everybody. <laughs>